presentation of the final outcomes from the Interdisciplinary Fellowship Program Inspiration Forum Lab 2021-22 under the topic Limits to Growth. I'm Lenka Hamushova and uh, I will guide you tonight through the project presentations and together with Zbigniew Baladran and uh, Lukasz Likavchan, um, I co-mentored co uh, this uh, program uh, over the last year. Exactly this time, a year ago, uh, eight Inspiration Forum Lab fellows arrived to, here to Yihlava to participate in, a, in, in an intensive kickoff week, uh, during which we got to know each other, brainst we brainstormed, we brainstormed uh, the program's topic, and we prepared the grounds for uh, the mostly online team collaboration that was coming. And this was quite a, a difficult process uh, because of uh, the interdisciplinary na nature of the program. So we had to find uh, some ways how to uh, explain each other the skills, skill set of uh, artists and skill set of uh, theorists and scientists. And for me, this was a very interesting uh, experience because uh, I really, truly believe in um, an interdisciplinary Uh, modeling techniques to set an objective limit to our human behavior, consi considering the, limit, uh, the limited sources and fragile balance of our planet. But at that time, it was not met with much understanding. And here we are now, half a century later, discovering the relevance of this report and realizing that we crossed these set limits by far. Actually, we crossed it just as a sacrifice for our own comfort and the hallucination of perpetual economic growth. This widespread denial of serious consequences for the environment is well rooted in the expensive and self-absorbed mindset of the Western culture, which prioritizes short-term convenience over responsibility towards the, the current or future form, forms of life around us. However, Envisioning different politics, it's not easy. And that's what we were trying to do. But it requires uh, stepping outside of the predefined scenarios and a comfort zone of your own thinking. And no matter how, how hard you try, you might still paradoxically find yourself within the limits of your own imagination while trying to imagine living within certain limits. So how to cross this vicious circle of entangled economic and social ima imaginaries that reside inside of us and co consciously or subconsciously influence our political actions? Can the concept of a limit be reimagined and re-established as a positive approach to creating a sustainable life for each other? And must we perceive limits in strict opposition to growth? Do we actually need growth at all? And finally, if there was a society or economy that would fit within the planetary limits, what would it look like? So these questions were at the beginning of the research journey of these three interdisciplinary project, projects that combine artistic re uh, practice with research methodologies and explore three different futures, which are the futures of cities, the future of river economies, uh, ecos ecosystems, and the future of flows of basic chemical elements. So we will now proceed to the shor to short presentations of each project. After these presentations, uh, there will be a five-minute space for questions. And 
there might be some little space uh, for additional questions at the end uh, of, of this session, but uh, we cannot guarantee that. So please, if you're curious, then try to ask uh, immediately after the presentation. So I was about to introduce the first project, which is called Mutual Core, case-based story of a transition. And uh, it's the project of the biggest group of uh, four fellows, uh, Julia Facin, Jan Skalichan, Jitka Kralova, and Jaroslav Michal. And we have uh, Jitka Kralova connecting online. Hello, Jitka. Hi. Um, hello to us. Uh, hello to Jihlava. Uh, greetings from London. Um, so I would like to briefly introduce you the outcome of our shared work. Um, it's kind of an audiovisual essay, uh, Mutual Core, which we've been working on for the past year. Um, and Mutual Core is largely based on a mini ethnographic fieldwork, which we conducted in Ostrava, during which we interviewed former miners, heavy steel workers, urban planners, social workers, activists, um, all these actors living in the region. And uh, through these conversations, we kind of wanted to explore the story of transitions, uh, specifically of Ostrava's mining past and the transition into the post-industrial uh, present and the kind of uncertain um, envisioned green future. Um, slide. So just to talk you briefly uh, through the research and creative process. So at the beginning, we had an idea to kind of tackle or provide some sort of a critique of the topic of green transition, which, as you might know, in the contemporary uh, Euro-American context has been um, closely associated with the new Green Deal policies. And uh, we thought it was a good example of the assigned topic of limits to growth uh, because the proposed green uh, transition currently embodies the primary strategy of tackling climate change. Uh, nevertheless, it continues to be embedded in the narratives and mechanisms of economic growth. So gradually we came up with uh, three kind of research questions, which you can see on the slide, which were going to guide our research. Um, however, the challenge was uh, how to translate this kind of conceptual ideas into some sort of audiovisual piece. Um, so we kind of realized that we had to find some sort of an example, either an object or a metaphor um, with which we could, uh, we could work. Um, slide. So um, given the fact that majority of us in the group were Czech speakers, uh, we thought to focus on a geographical area in the Czech Republic um, through which we could kind of tease some of the key elements of our research interest. And uh, straight away, we thought about the country's uh, coal mining regions, where um, with the end of socialism, um, a series of big transitions um, already taken place as the national economy shifted towards um, other production sectors. And we were kind of thinking pragmatically, and because one of our group members uh, was living in Ostrava, we decided to focus on this region. Um, so the idea was to conduct um, a mini ethnographic fieldwork through which we could document uh, local perspectives on the different social aspects of transitions. Um, and we did that by conducting interviews with uh, those different actors that I mentioned at the beginning and by documenting the visuality and the transformations of the landscapes using uh, video and photography. Um, it was really important for us to speak uh, with the people from the region who had primary experiences um, of these different transitions, especially the coal mining transition, um, because we wanted them to have the authorship over shaping the overall narrative. And also by talking to some of the representatives of the Roma community in the region, we wanted to amplify their voices and experiences, which um, often get missing in the mainstream narratives. So rather than studying the phenomenon of the transition um, from the top bottom, which is the usual um, approach, we decided to kind of emphasize on the bottom up narratives. 
Um, and there on the slide, you can see some pictures from the, from the field work. Um, if we can move to another slide. So um, we came back from the field work with hours and hours of material. Um, we had so many recorded interviews, um, sounds and uh, a lot of video footage. And I would say that at this point, uh, we really faced the challenge of um, trying to stitch together a coherent narrative, which would kind of do a justice to the amount of invested work, but also uh, try to address the research questions which we set for ourselves. Um, this was also uh, the moment where we kind of uh, encountered our differences of coming together from different fields the most. Um, each of us had a different idea of how to process the material, you know, some wanted the product to be more kind of minimalist and artistic and others, um, such as me, uh, wished for a more traditional documentary style outcome. So, you know, this process really required a lot of learning from one another, a lot of negotiating, um, kind of explaining and listening to each other um, until we reached some sort of a compromise that we would would be comfortable with. Um, and so we decided that the project is kind of consisting of three key elements. Um, the first one were the interview extracts, um, extracts, which would make up the main coherent narrative. Um, and they would be accompanied by um, an audio track, which was generated from the sounds, which we uh, recorded in the field, and also the video um, created from the footage we took during the field work. Um, slide. So um, then finally, in terms of the interview narrative, uh, what emerged most strongly uh, was um, the division of three temporal categories. So we would cover Ostrava's mining past, then the post-industrial present, and we wanted to capture the uncertain green futures. Um, but of course, the key question was how to use the video footage in a way that would best accompany this um, interview narrative. So uh, we were trying to see how they use the format of, a, of video to kind of illustrate um, our key message, was, which was the story of the transition. And uh, Julia, my colleague, she came up with this metaphor of a pixel, basically to simplify it um, to you. It was the fact that digital video is composed of uh, micro fragments of pixels where their coordination um, of these pixels makes the image possible. So kind of in a similar way as society is composed of individuals which coexist together to form the collective whole. Um, so by applying the progressive visual distortion, we wanted to symbolize uh, people's lack of vision for the better collective future, was what, which was something that was emerging strongly from, from the interviews. So we also then chose to incorporate some archival material with the aim of showing how uh, the nostalgia for the socialist past continues to impact people's experiences and, uh, and expectations uh, for the present. And uh, we also wanted to illum illuminate um, how past kind of affects present action and also the future imaginaries. And finally, we kind of wanted to stress that um, in order to plan or design the future, we must um, take into consideration the past as well. So um, to finish kind of my presentation, we would like to show you um, a trailer that we that Julia kind of put together just for this presentation. So yeah. It is not Konci 18. století objevil kovář Keltička uhlí tady kousek odsud na břehu Ostravice, tak tehdy začala historie Ostravy, jinak by Ostrava nebyla. Nebýt uhlí nebyla by Ostrava. Střediskem tohoto regionu byla Opala. Když se zrodila Ostrava, tak vzniklo umělé město. Ne město, které vzniká po staletí, ale město, které vzniklo během sta let s družováním obcí a hlavně přisunem lidí, kteří se přicházeli za prací, jak do dolů, tak do hudí. Nej, nej, nejvíc, co prostě tady já teď dělám na povrchu, to kamarádství. 
když budou mít nějaký problém, vždycky jsme si pomohli navzájem, protože člověk tam sám nedokáže nic. Jo? A tak se to žilo, a nádherné, to byl krásný život, opravdu krásný život. Jo? A dneska, dneska opravdu to nejde. The switch to a free market economy was for those big players in, in communist area a shock. A že tady přijde velmi rychle tržní prostředí, které já jsem sice chtěl, ale ne až tak nekontrolované. Já bych, co, co tam je, však si to vemte, já, víte, jak to bylo krásné, když si byla zelen všude. Dneska nikde nic není, dneska jsou obchody, parkoviště, jo, oni se pak děli, že je málo vody. Takže Ostrava je zelené město, které má jenom jeden jediný problém, protože neví, kam a kudy dál a hledá stále svoji identitu. Budoucnost, to, co já bych jako chtěla jako budoucnost, aby se měli moje děti a od mojich dětí líp, než se máme my. In further transformation, or in, in transformations in the future, that we will have winners and we have losers. But who are the winners and who will be the losers? Uh, this is not so easy to, to say. But uh, the burden for the workforce, I think, is still the same. It's a whole area called the Nanda Towns, it's a good one. To je normálně prostě takové, jak my se třeba teď tady se bavíme, že? Ale stejně z toho vy nic neuděláte, jo? Chápete, vy, vy jenom vyslechnete a uděláte si svůj názor, jo? A ten svůj názor buď bude dobrý nebo špatný. To už záleží na vás. could see the movie. <laughs> uh, are there any questions in the audience for Yipka? Uh, maybe, yeah, let's take some time to <laughs> think about it. Uh, I myself uh, have a question. Uh, Yipka, you mentioned uh, the need to find a compromise uh, in your group. And I was also thinking about it myself that you re needed to find uh, this thin line or this balance between uh, informative and poetic uh, side of the project. And I'm curious, how did you find the, this compromise or do you have any advice for other interdisciplinary teams uh, how to do that? Um. I'm not sure if I really have uh, like a coherent advice. I think what uh, really worked for our group was the fact that um, we were able to spend this one week together in Ostrava um, and we were kind of really sharing uh, our previous work with each other over a glass of beer in a more kind of informal setting and and you know, just kind of explaining where we are coming from, what are some of the approaches um, that we take in our work and just trying to understand each other. Uh, because I think if you're kind of working usually within your own discipline, you kind of take your approaches for granted or you kind of automatically stick to them because that's what you do, uh, but by listening to practitioners from other disciplines, you can kind of develop this different kind of understanding. And um, that's in the end what kind of worked um, in, in our project. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And uh, would you say, um, how did this experience influence you and your practice? Um, like now when you know how people from other disciplines work and also your uh, research methods maybe got confronted with different uh, approaches. Uh, are you going to use it in your practice or not really? Is it even possible to implement in uh, the real 
life, this kind of experience? Um, I think definitely just on the level of uh, kind of contacts. We already spoke uh, with Jan, for instance, who said, you know, because I, I kind of just started my PhD and I'm also thinking about the ways how um, to use, use my research in a way that just doesn't stay in the books. And, um, you know, visual kind of forms was always something that really attracted me, but I never had a chance to kind of try it out. And uh, thanks to this project, I, you know, I got more of an insight and, and it's definitely I would something I would like to consider um, in the future. But then, of course, as, as you might know, uh, these things uh, often depend a lot on, on funding and, and also time frame. I think for us, the biggest challenge was um, as it was getting longer and longer um, with, with this project, um, it was getting more and more difficult to kind of all of us stay concentrated and especially because we had to um, communicate uh, through Zoom, um, it was quite challenging. So I think for future projects, me personally, um, I would benefit more with being able to be in the same place um, and be able to kind of meet in person um, with my colleagues. That was that was very challenging for us. I'm not sure if this was the, the issue for other groups as well. Yeah, we can ask them uh, in, in a few minutes. Yeah, so th thank you, Itka. I hope you will be able to uh, implement this in your PhD. And I completely understand uh, how hard it is to come up with new methodologies, which, uh, uh, yeah, the, if you work in, on uh, interdisciplinary projects, then it doesn't fall in those uh, separate boxes. And indeed, it's a hard thing to do to explain it in uh, funding proposals and so on so but I hope this is something that's gonna change in the near future and especially with projects like this and uh, programs like this so thank you Yitka for your presentation and also for uh, your hard work on the project and now uh, I will introduce us our uh, second project uh, which is an audiovisual piece uh, and this piece li uh, listens to estuary of Gu Guadiana River at the border of Spain and Portugal and communicates a more than human perspective of the four future climate scenarios. So it's called Guadiana Inform Mov Movements and it's a project by Pedro Neto and Burak Korkmas. Hello guys. Can Shall we start? Yeah. Hello. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. I will start and then Burak will conclude. So greetings from Lisbon. Um, we want to start by stating that we feel very honored to be here today. And we owe a special thanks to Iveta, Lucas, Zbignac, Lenka, Teresa, and to all the more or less invisible team that made Inspiration Forum Lab possible. And of course, as well, all the organization behind the Ihlava Film Festival. Next slide, please. As you already know, the Inspiration Forum Lab offers a space where artists and scientists can meet and work together to create research-based multimedia art projects. And these projects are expected to combine scientific and artistic language to find ways of expression that communicate to varied audiences. Next. So it was with these premises in mind that Bura Korkmas and I, Pedro Net, started working together on what would become this experimental documentary piece Guadiana in four movements. Next. When we start working together, we thought it would make sense to find a case study to which we could relate and could have access to. And Burak is based in Seville and I'm based in Lisbon. So we search for potential contexts and situations in the Iberian Peninsula that could address last year's inspiration for our topic based on the work Limits to Growth. Among, next, please. Among other front runners, the Guadiana estuary emerged as a revealing case study on the impacts of climate change. Could you please play the video? Or is it playing? Maybe it's playing there. Um, yes, it's yeah. playing. Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so among other, as I was saying, among other front runners, the Guadiana estuary emerged as a revealing case study on the impacts of, of climate change. In the case from which we could further explore 
this idea of, of limit. Next. Indeed, since the 13th century, the Taguarian estuary acted as an imaginary natural borderline between Portugal and Spain. In 1926, upon the Convention of Limits, both countries eventually reached an agreement on the official border demarcation. The word limit then referred solely to the, to the legally binding abrupt frontier in the middle of a river. However, since then, other sorts of limits became gradually evident. Next. Despite being highly susceptible sorry, to flooding, aridity, wet scarcity, drought, and salinization, Guadiana continues to be used for power generation, hyperintensive agriculture, cattle grazing, and tourism. Next. Water flow management issues between upstream Spain and downstream Portugal have been the cause of several social and political disputes, and all the river divides both countries socially, economic, economically, and jurisdictionally for a significant part. The fact is that the Guadiana estuary remains a self-contained entity with a fragile and unique ecosystem. Next. In effect, once we get great more granular, we start to observe the hydroecological limits of the river, inevitably recalling the big picture forecast of the limits to growth back in 1972. Next. And please play the video. So we have gone through some of the literature on Guadiana, the region's historical background, governmental and non-governmental reports and agreements, digging up and systematizing existing data, namely from the IPCC, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. At the same time, we had it clear that we wanted to put our specific technical skills to work. Burak is an information designer and I'm an anthropologist and filmmaker. So with this in mind, we sought to explore the present and future of the transboundary Guadiana estuary using two complementary approaches. Next. The first was to find out how local people perceive and make sense of the effects of climate change in their daily lives, if any. And this led us to conduct fieldwork along the Guadiana estuary. We took an exploratory and sensory ethnographic approach as a way to take the pulse of the place, trying to capture some dynamics between local people and their environments, and of course, other non-human presences. And during this process, we collected diverse sounds and images that would in part nurture our final piece. So with this, next, please. With this, began exploring the different types of sources and materials we had in our hands and how these could connect and mesh together in a meaningful way, next. We can say that the assemblage of such diverse materials was marked by an exploration of how the depicted elements could connect rather than how they are or were. Next. The second approach was sought via data sonification in an attempt to move the case beyond a specific location and in an attempt to render it more universal. Burak. Uh, Burak, you are muted. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Hi there, I'm Burak from Seville. Uh, before we talk about data sonification, I walk through you the data and the depth of it. Then I'll explain our steps to create the data sonification part and the reason and the approach and the tools behind it. Next slide, please. Please uh, play the video. We, used to use an, uh, we decided to use an audio way to show the data instead of visualization because of the great amount of the data we've gathered from the IPCC, Eurostat, national and regional data portals from Spain and Portugal. It became quite overwhelming when we had the data in our hands that you're seeing right now, and it felt impossible to use it in a comprehensive way in this pretty constrained project like the duration and the resources. So we needed to seek for an unconventional, different approach. And this is where data sonification came in handy. Next slide, please. Data-driven projects, especially visual ones, notoriously fail to demonstrate the human aspect of the issues they are tackling. Next. 
data sonification challenges representations of climate change scenarios, which often come in the form of visualized projection. Moreover, some have even argued that sound can offer a panoptic view from above and from the future in an almost prophetic fashion. Next, please. So we thought what better way to show the dimensions of the data and the similarities of climate crisis scenarios with human and emotional components than by combining music, noise, and soundscapes. Next, please. And a video. Understanding the available data is crucial before selecting certain data sets. What is measuring? How is it collected? Do they mean anything at all? However, the data on the project mean temperatures from the IPCC 6 assessment report and also national data forces from Portugal and Spain still fail to treat the Guardian ecosystem as a whole entity, placing it onto different jurisdictions, in short, distinct and incohesive data sources. To overcome this obstacle, we focus on the transporting part of the river, the lower and partially middle Guadiana River estuary. We use the broader term estuary rather than river basin to mesh up the available data of the adjacent jurisdictions of the both countries, Evora, Beja and Faro on the Portuguese side and Huelva on the Spanish side. As a result, the film unfolds in four parts based on four different IPCC scenarios, IPCC scenarios conveyed as data certification. This enables a better understanding and appreciation of changes and structures in the data that underlie the display. There's a variety of great tools and libraries for data certification. If you're interested in it, uh, I, I, I put a very detailed walkthrough on our page, guadianaforums.eu for data certification aficionados. Next slide, please. And the video. What you're seeing right now, now is the legend of the data certification from the beginning of the work. The mean temperatures of four different IPCC scenarios as double best act as a core auditory dimension, building momentum towards the end. The consecutive two other data sets of maximum and minimum temperatures as synth cause a metronome effect and create almost a melody. <clears throat> Next, please. Guardian in four moments then emphasize and moreover transduces the limits to growth of Guardian River Basin. Last but not least, data sonification challenges the viewer pointing to how what one hears is related to what one believes should be heard, as well as what one thinks about the nature of sounds. Unfortunately, two days ago when you had the screening, we couldn't be there in person, but uh, I hope you had a chance to attend to it at the Love of Film Festival. And uh, thanks for everything. Uh, and right now you can watch the trailer. Thank you. Thank you, Burak. Thank you, Pedro. Bye, thanks. Uh, are there any questions in the audience? Uh, there is also a trailer. Uh, yeah, is it the next slide? Next slide and the trailer. Yeah. Can you maybe share with us uh, how this whole experience influenced uh, you and your practice? Uh, it can be like the, the stepping outside of the comfort zone of what you what you know so far and learning a new skill, or uh, this uh, going to the to the f to make the field uh, research together. 
what was the most uh, yeah important? I, I think my experience maybe it differs from Pedro's but also compared to the other groups it didn't feel like we left our comfort zone because somehow we were quite similar with Pedro the way of our thinking and how how we use the same language uh so we didn't have any problems to understand each other or build up on what we're saying uh in both ways i mean online and, and uh, like real um but uh for me it was quite challenging trying to convey the data into sound which i never did before i was quite interested in that but uh, probably you always need a reason to get into something and that was quite overwhelming for me and probably also for Pedro uh, to work with this material. What do you say, Pedro? No, yeah, actually, I mean, we, our, this, the, the old experience at the beginning actually went quite well in spite of our different skills. Um, and also, I, for me, as an anthropologist, I often work alone. As a filmmaker, that's not the case. But in this case, because we, we also employed a very exploratory uh, approach in terms of ethnography, if we want to call it. And to work with someone else was also interesting to, to, to have that, that game in which we would have to, to, to deal with our own presences at the same time. And in that sense, to uh, ethnography and anthropology is often a, a very solitary endeavor and, and this experience make, made me realize that actually you can conduct um, also this sort of um, of exercises together, and um, and beyond that, it was I'm I'm very disorganized and Burak also something that mirrors also his activity being uh, just we used to systematize vast swaths of data, really get me insights, uh, provide me insights on how to also try to reorganize and and see data from a different point point of view and and um so i think it was a very enriching experience working uh, with burak and we intend to actually we intend to continue working in the future so oh, that's good th to this hear. i think is <laughs> telling yeah thank thank you for sharing your experience and uh, uh, unfortunately we have to move on because of uh, limited time so thank you again for uh, presenting your project and uh, we will move to the last project uh, which is uh, a speculative scenario that which invites us to think about the future of crops in connection to the limited source of phosphorus. It's called fertilizer rehab, a speculative exploration of post-fertilizer rehabilitation by Hanna Komanova and Karolina Zizkova. And we have Karolina here in person. So I will now give the mic <laughs> to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for uh, the introduction and also for putting together this cool program. Yeah, it was not only me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the whole team. <laughs> so uh, we also have a presentation. Uh, OK. So uh, I'm very happy that together with uh, Hanna Komanova, who is uh, connected online, uh, we can present our project called the Fertilizer Rehab, which is, as you mentioned, a speculative exploration of post-fertilizer rehabilitation of plants. Uh, we created uh, an installation that uh, asked the core question, how are crops and people going to react to the unavailability of uh, industrial fertilizers? Uh, next slide. So to give you a little bit of a context, uh, uh, I would like to talk a bit about phosphorus, which is an essential element for all living beings. And it's also one of the three main components of uh, industrial fertilizers. And the uh, current uh, global agricultural system depends on synthetic fertilizers. And uh, so do the crops or the current cultivars uh, themselves, because uh, they were in the process of breeding the cultivars. Uh, the, breeders, uh, the breeders uh, traded in their ability to secure nutrients from, from the soil uh, to different abilities or different properties of the plants, such as fast growth. So the plants now, the cultivars in agriculture, they are not able to secure the nutrients uh, by themselves, and they depend on these uh, nutrients inputs from the fertilizers. 
And uh, the breeders did that assuming that there will be always uh, enough uh, phosphorus for fertilizers. But uh, this assumption is actually quite uh, wrong <laughs> because uh, uh, phosphorus is being sourced from uh, phosphate rock and it is uh, a finite resource. So uh, it has been forming for, um, for like 10 to 15 million years and its extraction is reaching the limits. And there is a, some kind of a breaking point, which is called the peak phosphorus, estimated in 2030, which is the maximum rate of extraction of phosphate rock. Uh, there is another problem also with the phosphate rock that uh, the uh, quality of the material that is being extracted uh, is uh, decreasing. There are decreasing concentrations of phosphorus and increasing concentrations of uh, heavy metals and uh, unwanted particles and clays. So this leads to more uh, expensive and more difficult uh, forms of mining, such as mining from the seabed. And uh, next slide. Uh, and also, uh, for me and Hannah, phosphorus has also quite interesting history because it was uh, discovered in, uh, uh, by uh, an alchemist, uh, Hennig Brandt, in the 17th century. And uh, he did that uh, by accident basically, because he was uh, searching for a so-called uh, philosopher's stone, and uh, he repeatedly uh, boiled large amounts of urine, and then he isolated phosphorus for the first time. So knowing this, we uh, imagined some kind of a service or laboratory in a post-peak phosphorus uh, times that is uh, mixing, uh, that is like uh, somewhere uh, on the edge of alchemy and synthetic biology as well, and uh, then we started to build a narrative about what kind of services could such a, like a workspace provide in the future for crops and people. Uh, next one. Hey, hi, hi from London. Um, this is our installation. I will explain a little bit about it as well. Um, this fine line of blending two different worlds, um, as Carolina mentioned, is displayed throughout the installation. Um, we ended up enclosing the fertilizer rehab in a clear PVC tent um, is its own little DIY semi-sterile lab. And it's lit up by pink grow light um, used for seed germination. Um, what was interesting for us was to explore visually the contrast of controlled environment, um, exactness, sterility of modern science, and um, blend it with a different aesthetic, um, one which is more tied with alchemical experimentation. The aim was to blur the line between what is seen as scientific and what is seen as non-scientific, as well as what's seen as natural and what's artificial. Uh, next slide, please. But before speculating on different solutions um, to the dwindling phosphate uh, rock resources, we had to understand the problem, which is the overuse of synthetic fertilizers um, as Carolina mentioned at the beginning. Um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are the main ingredients in synthetic fertilizers on which, uh, along with other high energy inputs, the current global agriculture system depends. At most, a quarter of the phosphorus in fertilizers is used by plants, uh, while the rest remains in the soil, from which the fertilizer is washed into surface waters. This causes pollution, plankton overgrowth, and algal blooms. Um, over 50% of phosphorus is lost to the environment and practically therefore wasted. Next slide, please. Uh, some phosphorus remains stored in the soil due to long-term over-fertilization, but it's difficult to, for, for the plants to obtain it. Plant cultivars currently used in agriculture don't have the ability to retrieve stored phosphorus and are dependent on the overuse of synthetic fertilizers to which they have been cultivated for um, this very much distinguishes them from the wild and land-raised varieties, which had been developed, uh, which have developed different strategies to secure minerals, including extensive root systems, uh, the secretion of chemicals that release phosphorus from the soil, or symbiosis with fungi. But for most crops, uh, their self-preservation functions have been traded in for rapid growth. Next slide. 
so uh, in the installation, uh, the plants are uh, going through a rehab, which is uh, displayed through uh, some equipment and the plants themselves, uh, suggesting experimentations with uh, their roots and their properties. And uh, also we were referencing uh, current uh, research in microbiology. So it's based on a real research that is like currently uh, being, uh, yeah, you know what I mean, <laughs> sorry. And then we were also uh, suggesting uh, recycling urine as one of the options of uh, like sourcing phosphorus from some kind of a renewable source, which is also something that uh, is already like taking place in many uh, forms. Uh, next one. And we also uh, developed this uh, website, which is uh, slightly interactive. There are uh, photos from the, from the exhibition and uh, photos of other parts of the installation, such as this uh, uh, sample box with uh, objects uh, that, uh, contain, uh, lar mm, that contain phosphorus as well, and with the descriptions and our texts and, yeah, like much more info. So, yeah, that's it. Uh, next one. Yeah, and speaking of the website, um, it also features visual research on how the imagined landscapes of post-peak phosphorus um, times will look like once the extraction reaches its tipping point. These are represented in a calendar through the, inst through the installation generated by machine learning using images of depleted mines in the Estonia, Nauru, Kiribati and Florida, combined with those in Morocco, Australia and the Western Sahara, where the resources are inevitably running out. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so to wrap it up, um, how will plants and humans react to the lack of phosphorus? Um, well, the answer can have the form of experimentation with plant properties, their creation and recreation. Another option is to try obtain phosphorus from sources other than non-renewable phosphate rocks, for example, by recycling urine. Um, or perhaps the inevitable transformation of society, realizing the limits to growth and going on a literal rehab will do the trick. And thus concludes our exploration of peak phosphorus. Um, we would like to thank um, you for the time. Uh, we hope to bring awareness to and spark curiosity around this topic and hopefully facilitate some interesting discussions further on. But mostly we'd like also like to thank Inspiration Forum Lab, its organizers and our tutors for the help and support we've received. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, we have last five minutes that we can be here, so I will ask uh, our audience for last chance to ask questions. And until there is a question, uh, I have a question for you too. What was the hardest for you uh, during this last year? of collaboration and working on this project. So if uh, I may start, uh, we did like really extensive research, I think. And uh, uh, in the end, it was very difficult for us to translate all the knowledge we gained, like from various fields, as I mentioned, from microbiology, also from some uh, um, design, from uh, environmental anthropology, uh, it was difficult to translate or transform this into something uh, visual or something that can be like physically placed in, uh, in an installation. And also, uh, as it was mentioned here a few times, we worked online, so uh, we didn't, maybe we didn't choose the, the best uh, kind of form. Uh, I would do it again, but uh, considering the fact that we were working online, Hannah is based in London and I'm uh, here in Czech Republic, uh, we ended up doing some, uh, we ended up doing an installation, something physical that has to be transported and like put together. We built this uh, in my in my flat uh, during one week when we met during the year. So yeah, that was also quite quite difficult to to physically uh, create this. Yeah. Thanks, Hannah. Do you want to say something? Mm, I think I very much agree with what what was said. Um, yeah, the. The format of it being online, I think, did um, push us to focus a lot on theory and the fact that we did it remotely. That that was one means of how we could connect the the or the well, basically, the continuation of the project was just done th in through theory. And yeah, that was that did prove to be problem 
as Carolina mentioned. Yeah, I think it uh, sums up uh, our, our discussion d during this evening about uh, this kind of uh, interdisciplinary collaboration that uh, I personally, like I would like to highlight two points that are very important that I now remembered from uh, uh, the, the presentations. And one is uh, to getting to know each other really well and uh, uh, maintaining some kind of a dialogue as a basis for this collaboration. And the second, like you uh, are mentioning, is to uh, maybe like not stay only in the online space, but also uh, combine it with the physical reality, which is still here. It's still, <laughs> we can still afford it. <laughs> yeah, I have a theory that in the future, physical reality will be a luxury. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's really great that you could uh, combine it with a physical uh, installation and yeah, last uh, possibility to ask a question if there is any. And otherwise, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you for uh, your presentation. And uh, I would like to mention one last uh, information and that's that this program, uh, Inspiration Forum Lab, this was the pilot uh, year and it will happen again. And it's not going to happen uh, every year, but there's a plan uh, to open uh, next round in uh, the summer 2023. So if uh, you're interested in this kind of uh, experiment and would like to collaborate uh, with others, other interesting people, then uh, yeah, just uh, look uh, for the information when there's uh, an open call. So thank you for uh, listening and see you around. <laughs>